Kia ora tato. In this lecture, we'll look at finding the girth of a graph and then discuss issues of connectivity in graphs and digraphs. So recall that the girth of a graph is the length of the shortest cycle in the graph and it's undefined if no such cycle exists. And if the graph in question is a digraph, then its girth is just the girth of the underlying graph. So in small toy examples, we can often just find the girth of a graph by hand, but that clearly doesn't scale to large graphs. So what algorithmic tools do we have? Well, it's tempting to start with DFS, as we know there's a relationship between back arcs and cycles. So here's an idea. How about we look for the shortest cycle through a particular vertex V by starting a DFS from V and finding a back arc that goes back through V. This method will find a cycle through V, but will, will it find the shortest cycle through V? Let's have a look. Well, consider this graph here. If we start a DFS at vertex 0, using our standard convention of choosing the vertex with the lowest index when there's a choice, we'll first visit uh, vertex 1, then vertex 2, and then vertex 3, at which point we've finished our traversal. Um, and we see that this arc here is a back arc pointing uh, from 3 back to 0. And so we've identified this cycle through 0, 1, 2, 3, and back to 0 of length 4, but not the shorter cycle through 0, 1, 3, and 0, which is of length 3. So if we're interested in finding the shorter cycle through V, then DFS isn't going to do it. But it turns out we can use BFS breadth-first search to find cycles in a graph. Consider that starting from a vertex V, BFS visits first vertices at distance 1, then distance 2, and so on. So if V lies on a cycle, the BFS will explore the cycle in both directions, eventually ending up at some vertices X and Y, both on the other side of the cycle from V and connected by some edge. So let's look at our example again, this time performing a BFS starting at node 0. So uh, from 0, we'll cross the edge to 1 and cross the edge to 3. Then from 1, we'll cross the edge to 2, at which point we visited everything. But we also encounter this edge here from 1 to 3, which in this case is now a uh, a cross arc. And so um, we have the cycle, we've identified the cycle from 0 to 1 to 3 and back to 0, which is the shortest cycle through 0. So let's formalize this and write it out as an algorithm. So for finding the girth of a graph using BFS, the idea is that we'll first find the shortest cycle through vertex V, and then we'll loop over all vertices and take the shortest cycle we find in the entire graph, and that'll be the girth. So let's perform um, BFS visit, starting at vertex V. And when we're performing that visit, if the current vertex is X, and we meet a gray neighbor, Y, that is, we're at X, and we cross the edge XY to find vertex Y that is also gray, then the walk from V to X to Y and back to V is a cycle. Let's see that in pictorial format. So the root of our search tree is at V. We've traversed down to uh, we've traversed down to X. We've traversed down to Y, and now we're at X and we cross this edge to Y, and then we've got a cycle from V to X to Y and back up to V. And the length of the cycle is simply the depth of x plus the depth of y plus 1 to represent this edge here. So we found a cycle, and we found the length of that cycle. The question is, is that the shortest cycle? Well, there's two cases to consider. 
either x and y are on the same level, or y is one level deeper than x. Now, in the first case, when x and y are on the same level, then the cycle is as short as it po can possibly be, so we can stop. In the case that the uh, depth of x is one, one less than uh, the depth of y, then we need to continue to the end of the level we are currently exploring to ensure there's not a missing cycle of length uh, 2dx plus 1. And in this latter case, once the end of the level is reached, we return the shortest value of L found. So using this method, we can find the length of the shortest cycle through any vertex v. So we can find the girth of the graph simply by performing the procedure um, for every vertex v in the graph and taking the minimum length of cycle that we find across the whole graph. How long does this procedure take? Well, since BFS is linear in the size plus order of the graph, and we need to run it n times, once for each vertex, the running time for finding the girth using this algorithm is order n times n plus m. And so that running time, like a lot of these problems we've looked at, will depend on the density of the graph. In the worst case, when the graph is dense, it is at worst cubic in the order of the graph. We can apply a similar technique to find the directed girth of a digraph. So to find the shortest directed cycle through a node, we'll run BFS starting at V, and then the first time a back arc of the form XV is found, we found a cycle from V to X and back to V, so of length equal to 1 plus the depth of X. Now notice that any cycle found after this first one will be at least as long as the first one. So we can stop the algorithm immediately and return the length of this first cycle found. Once again, we can use this to find the girth by running this procedure for every node in the digraph and finding the minimum of all cycle lengths. Once again, the running time is simply order n plus m for each traversal. We need to do n traversals, so we've got a running time of big theta n squared plus n times m. So we're never going to be doing worse than cubic in the order of the graph. Now I'd like to talk about connectivity in graphs. The basic idea is that a graph is connected when it's all in one piece, in the sense that you can get from one vertex to any other in the graph by following a path. Well, look at the idea in detail first in graphs, and then see how it generalizes over to digraphs. So first, let's look at the definition. So the definition is a simple one. A graph is connected if for each pair of vertices, u and v, there is a path from u to v. And obviously that means that there's a path from v back to u as well. Let's look at an example. So this graph is connected as we can get from any vertex to any other by following the edges. But if we remove this edge and this edge, the graph becomes disconnected. So this graph is now not connected as if we start at vertex zero, there are no paths out. So the different parts of a graph that are disconnected from one another are known as the connected components. So one connected component, com component here is just the vertex zero, another connected component is other vertices one, two, and three. So it's a somewhat obvious but useful fact that every graph G can be written uniquely as a union of its connected components. So we've got a short result about that. So the result says that any graph G can be uniquely written as a union of subgraphs GI such that each of the subgraphs GI is itself connected and for distinct subgraphs if I and J are different there are no edges from vertices of GI to GJ. Right? So these are you know, how we conceive of um, connected components. 
So in our example we saw before, the connected components of this are just zero and one, two, three. As an aside, notice that the components of G define an equivalence relationship on the vertices of G. Vertices U and V are, the same, are in the same equivalence class if and only if U and V are in the same connected component of G. And that's if and only if there's a path from U to V. But if we're given a graph G, how do we find the connected components of the graph? Well, we can simply run a BFS or DFS traversal on them and note that the connected components of G correspond precisely to the subgraphs spanned by the trees in the search forest. Thus, the number of connected components in a graph is just the number of times BFS or DFS visit is called in a traversal. So finding the number of components in a graph is simply has running time big theta n plus m, which is the running time of either a BFS or a DFS traversal. But talking about connectivities and digraphs is more tricky. It's not just a matter of looking to see if the digraph is all in one piece. Consider this example. So on the face of it, it looks to be all in one piece, but while we can get from node 0 to node 1 and on to node 2, or from 2 to 1, notice that if we start in node 1 or node 2, we can't actually get back to node 0. Okay, so clearly we need a, a, a further concept to understand connectivity and di digraphs, and we'll define something called strong connectivity. So in the digraph situation, we'll say G is strongly connected if for any pair of nodes U and V, uh, there is a path from U to V and also a path from V to U. So in other words, G is strongly connected if any U and V are mutually reachable. And if we define a strongly connected component as being a maximal subdigraph of G such that it's strongly connected, so rather than connected components, now we've got strongly connected components in a digraph, and they're defined as the maximal subdigraphs of G that are strongly connected, where maximal means we've added all possible nodes that we could that we could add before it's no longer strongly connected. So in the example we looked at before, the strongly connected components are simply 0 and 1, 2. So how can we go about finding the strongly connected components of a digraph? Well, it's easy to see that running a simple traversal, as we did to find the connected components of a graph, does not work here. Let's just take a look at our uh, simple example. We'll start a depth-first search from node 0, we'll visit node 1, then we'll visit node 2, and we're done. This produces a search forest consisting of just one tree, rather than the two strong components that we want, 0 and 1 and 2. Notice though that if we'd started a traversal in, in 1, we would have visited 1, then 2, and then had a second search tree starting in 0. So this perhaps gives us a clue about how we, how we might tackle this problem. And in fact it turns out there's a very nice algorithm that finds the strongly connected components that's called Tarjan's algorithm and it does so in linear time and we'll discuss that in the next lecture.